If there are any problems with the audio, for example, it's terrible, it's echoing, so on and so forth, use the chat and tell uh, my very capable assistant, Anna Rose Davidson, and she'll try to work her magic. Anything so far, or are we okay? All right, good. My name is Bernard Prusak, and I'm a professor of philosophy at King's and the director of the McGowan Center for Ethics and Social Responsibility. For people on Zoom who don't know this already, King's is a relatively small Catholic liberal arts college sponsored by the Congregation of Holy Cross in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, which is in more or less the northeastern corner of the state. The McGowan Center hosts 10 to 15 lectures and panel discussions per academic year, all now on Zoom, even when they're in person like this event tonight. We're still all right, Zoom audio and video? Good. Good. So, this event is our uh, annual observance of Constitution Day, which strictly speaking is September 17, so Saturday, and that commemorates the signing of the Constitution in Philadelphia 235 years ago. This event is also the kickoff of homecoming. So it's this event, not the football game, that's the kickoff of homecoming. This year, Kings, and special welcome to alumni and alumni uh, for joining us. Thanks also to Beth Doherty for her collaboration. Thanks further to Commonweal Magazine, and I imagine a lot of our, our Zoom viewers uh, have some connection to Commonweal for co-sponsoring and helping to advertise this year's event. I'm grateful to Gabriella Wilkie for her collaboration. For people in the room, as you entered, uh, you might have seen some copies of the magazine there. Feel free to take a, a copy now or on your way out. Last but not least, uh, thanks to our speakers for being with us. One of our speakers is here in the room and the other speaker is there. I'm hoping you can see her on Zoom. She's through Zoom too. Dr. Uh, Michael Moreland is University Professor of Law and Religion and Director of the Eleanor H. McCullen Center for Law, Religion and Public Policy at Villanova University. He is a scholar of constitutional law, tort, bioethics and religious freedom with a PhD in theology from Boston College, as well as a law degree from the University of Michigan. Before joining the law school faculty at Villanova, he served as a clerk in the United States Court of Appeals for the 10th Circuit and as Associate Director for Domestic Policy at the White House under President George W. Bush. This is Mike's fourth Constitution Day for, uh, event for us, and that's a record for any of my speakers. Uh, so normally we don't have people back four times, but it just goes to show how excellent Mike is. I, I looked at my bio uh, for you last year and at the very end, I promised at your fourth event that I would give you a pin. So <laughs> I'll need to work on that. Uh, you know, maybe this evening. Our respondent is Molly Wilson O'Reilly. Uh, she is Commonweal's editor at large. After undergraduate studies at Yale University, she joined the magazine as an editor in two 2008. She writes and speaks on culture, religion, and politics, with particular interests in theater, women in the church, and the ministry of Pope Francis. This is Molly's third time uh, visiting us at King's, and um, I've, if Mike's the only speaker who's been here four times. I think you're the only speaker who's been here three times. She's joined us twice via Zoom and once in person way back in 2014. For nuts and bolts, Mike will speak for 30 to 35 minutes or so. Ali will reply for 10 minutes. Then we'll turn to discussion and Q&A. People on Zoom, please ask your questions, not through the chat, but you can do that if you really want. But if you'd use the Q&A function, that would be easier. And you can find that function toward the bottom of your page. So thanks again, everybody here in the room and also on Zoom for joining us. Michael, take it away. Well, uh, thank you, Bernard, uh, for this invitation to come back again. I think last year we talked about the Electoral College. Uh, that was all online, everyone. I was at my home in outside Philadelphia. And it's nice to be back uh, here at King's. Uh, thanks to also to the McGowan Center and to 
uh, the staff. Uh, and thanks also to Molly Wilson O'Reilly and to Commonweal uh, for their participation here as well. So uh, we've had uh, some of these events. We, I think one year talked about the presidency. One year we talked about immigration. We talked about the electoral college. And this year for Constitution Day, Bernard decided to ramp up the level of controversy considerably uh, and talk about the issue of abortion. And I acknowledge at the outset that there is uh, no more contested issue in American constitutional law and politics. As one commentator put it, it's only slightly overstating the case to say that um, almost everything in American politics since the 1970s has been about abortion in one way or another. Uh, and I want to say that uh, for my purpose for these uh, brief, you know, 30 minutes or so of remarks, I focus specifically since this Constitution Day uh, observance, uh, I want to speak specifically about the law of abortion and the constitutional law of abortion. I want to bracket or at least pu push to one side for the moment questions about the morality of abortion or the politics of abortion or the Catholic Church in abortion, which isn't to say those aren't highly relevant topics and, and gladly uh, talk to them in question and answer and Molly may well raise them as well in her response. But I think uh, for, for this purpose, I wanna focus at least for the time being specifically on the issue of the constitutional law of abortion and to advance an argument that you can tell me whether you agree with me or not at the end, uh, either by asking a question or by throwing something at me or whatever you want. And that is, even if you believe matter of sound policy or morality that abortion should be widely available and widely legal in various circumstances, that what the Supreme Court did this summer in Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Center was a long overdue necessary correction to American constitutional law. That is the argument I want to make. Uh, and like I said, you can tell me at the end if you agree with it or not. I know that um, uh, we are undergraduates, uh, and so uh, you're not lawyers yet, although I encourage you to go to law school if you want and to come to Villanova especially. Uh, but I, I think it's uh, helpful to kind of set some of the, the landscape here because uh, it does turn out that the constitutional law of abortion is complex, uh, has been uh, long in development, uh, right up to uh, the current uh, or the last Supreme Court term in Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health. Specifically to focus in on the kind of key distinction that I think is at the outset of this, and that is how do we interpret and understand the scope of constitutional rights? How do we interpret and understand what rights the Constitution protects and what rights the Constitution does not protect? And the key distinction often made there is between enumerated rights and unenumerated rights, which is a fancy way of saying rights provided for specifically and textually in the Constitution and rights that are not enumerated and textually provided for in the Constitution. And uh, if you look at the Constitution, uh, there's no mention of abortion. And you can look all through the original articles, which we're celebrating the anniversary of their ratification uh, or their, their signing at the Convention of Philadelphia, they were ratified by the colonies. Uh, or then uh, look at the uh, amendments and there's nothing about abortion in the text of the constitution. There are a lot of enumerated rights in the constitution. The first eight or so amendments, the Bill of Rights, rights of freedom of speech, free exercise of religion, the right to keep and bear arms, the various rights against unreasonable searches and seizures. Those are all provided in the first several amendments of the constitution, but nothing about abortion. So what grounds the right to abortion as a matter of, at least some argue, constitutional rights. And it's the 14th Amendment, which is the amendment enacted after the Civil War, uh, ratified in 1868, which says in the relevant part, section one, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. So for 50 years, there's been a pitched battle about whether that text from fourth, the 14th Amendment, Section 1, provides the basis for recognition of a constitutional right to abortion. And the grounding for it 
or so the argument has been in that phrase liberty, specifically the line that nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Now, there are lots of liberties that one could invoke uh, over and against government regulation. The liberty to possess and use drugs in the privacy of your home, or the liberty right to use my property as I wish to open a restaurant out of my house, even though my house is zoned in Radnor Township, Pennsylvania for residential use, and I can't open a restaurant as it matters. But none of those have been thought to create any constitutional right uh, for various reasons. But the question then becomes, well, what about this right of, of what, what is the basis for arguing that it should be recognized as an unenumerated right under the 14th Amendment? Section one. And here the, the, uh, the opinion of the court in Dobbs this summer argues for an approach to these rights in the 14th Amendment that says if they are to be recognized, these unenumerated rights that are thought to be part of the liberty right that we have uh, uh, under the 14th Amendment, that they have to be deeply rooted in the nation's history and legal tradition and essential to an order of liberty. That's the key test that the Supreme Court says we should think of when we inquire as to whether or not something should be 14th Amendment right. And the kind of technical label for this is sometimes called substantive due process. Say that the due process clause of the 14th Amendment section one creates substantive rights, not just procedural fairness rights, but substantive rights and that these substantive rights include a whole set of unenumerated rights that aren't already provided for in the earlier or that may be later amendments to the Constitution. So at least in the court's view, this is primarily a historical question about whether or not the right to abort is one of these rights that is deeply rooted in the nation's history in this essential scheme of ordered liberty. Now, just a little footnote here about uh, constitutional history for you about kind of the history of this idea of substantive due process and uh, the kind of long arc of interpretation and cases about it. So there was a period going way back more than 100 years ago, starting in the early 20th century in 1905, when the Supreme Court in a case called Lochner versus New York held that a new that limited the overtime hours that bakers could work was institutional infringement upon their freedom of contract to work overtime if they wanted. And this ushered in a long period for 30 years or so of cases in which the Supreme Court, in the name of substantive due process under the 14th Amendment, said that restrictions on people's ability to contract over and against economic regulation by the government was protected by the 14th Amendment. So minimum wage laws and over laws uh, regulating labor practices, that all these were held to be uh, in a series of cases, some, some actually going the other way, but in a number of cases coming out in favor of the freedom of contract argument. And that was true from 1905 until 1937, when in the New Deal revolution, the court decided that this substantive due process right of freedom of contract with regard to economic regulation was not something that the 14th Amendment substance due process clause protected against. Amid that period from 1905 to 1937, when the court was offering economic regulation under the banner of substance due process, the court cases in 1923 and in 1925, that there was also a substantive due process right of parents with regard to the education and upbringing of their children. And especially at the Catholic University, it's an interesting question because what one case, 1925, Pierce versus Society of Sisters held was that when Oregon enacted the statute required that all children attend public schools, no one could attend religious or private schools, attend public schools. Uh, and religious schooling was foreclosed. The court in 1925 said that that violated the 14th Amendment's section one provision because the right of parents to direct the 
education and upbringing of their children, including choosing private education or religious education was a right protected in the constitution. So that's a kind of quick and dirty summary of what in my con law class, we spend a couple days on. The it's kind of, if you will, substantive due process 1.0, the era from 1905 to 1937, Lochner striking down economic regulation under the banner of substantive due process. And then Pierce and uh, another case, Myers versus Nebraska in the 1920s, saying that there's also substantive due process right of parents with regard to the upbringing of their children. But post 1937, post a case called West Hotel versus Parish, which restricted overtime hours worked by women, uh, in which the court had upheld that and said that essentially overruled Lochner. Post 1937, substantive due process arguments had a kind of bad odor to them. It was thought that that Lochner era was a mistake, that the court had read into the Constitution kind of laissez-faire free market economic principles, given them the imprimatur of the 14th Amendment and struck down a lot of state and federal regulations that were attempting uh, in the name of labor, this is and other things to, uh, to accomplish good ends. But then starting in the 1960s, substantive due process came back again. And it particularly came back in a case in 1965 called Griswold versus Connecticut, which involved a Connecticut law that uh, criminalized the possession use distribution of contraceptives to married couples. And in 1965, the court kind of on substantive due process grounds, but not in the majority opinion, but for another amendments, the ninth amendment, the third amendment, which prohibits uh, uh, the government from requiring the quartering of soldiers in homes, came up with a set of arguments that said that as to privacy, intimacy, family decisions, reproduction, there's a zone of privacy protected by the constitution. And that that is again, under different arguments, but that's also something the constitution recognizes. Interestingly, at the oral argument in Griswold versus Connecticut, it's recorded, and I believe the historical record shows that it was Chief Justice Warren who asked this question, said, well, if we agree with you that there's a constitutional right to use contraceptives by married couples, does that mean that there's also a privacy right of abortion? And the counsel for the challenger in Griswold versus Connecticut said, absolutely not. No way that the constitution could be read to include a right to abortion. Well, eight years later in 1973, the court did say that in the famous Roe versus Wade decision. And this time said for reasons of substantive due process, a straight up 14th amendment argument that section one of the 14th amendment protects liberty against infringements without due process. And that this includes a privacy right of women to choose to have an abortion. And uh, again, there's a lot, uh, whole books have been written about Roe. You can have a whole class, uh, several classes on Roe versus Wade. Um, but a few things to highlight about what the court said in Roe. Uh, it said that there's this right of abortion uh, and it imposed this trimester framework, honestly, saying that essentially for the first three months of pregnancy, the state can't regulate abortion at all. For the next trimester of pregnancy up to roughly viability, the state can only regulate pregnancy to um, basically to protect maternal health. And then uh, for the third trimester of pregnancy, the state may regulate post viability, the state may regulate abortion, uh, but may not do so in a way that uh, infringes upon, poses a threat to a woman's uh, life or health. And Importantly, there are several things we could say about Roe versus Wade. The thing that the courts had done in a lot of these substantive due process cases, including in Griswold versus Connecticut, and looking back even to the earlier cases, is that they had looked, as I said, to the question of what's been the nation's deeply rooted legal tradition and historical practice. What have the states been doing with regard to this question? Oregon was an outlier in prohibiting religious and private schooling. Connecticut was an extreme outlier in 
prohibiting contraceptives by married couples. Roe versus Wade struck down and invalidated the law of every state in one decision. Every state, except with the possible exception of New York, which had just passed a more liberal abortion law signed by uh, then Governor Nelson Rockefeller, with the possible exception of New York, Roe versus Wade invalidated the laws of 49 or 50 states. And not surprisingly, and I don't need to tell you, it generated enormous controversy that lasted uh, and has continued to last right up to today. Uh, lots to say about the politics of abortion and the way in which uh, the parties, you know, were uh, aligned one way, uh, one way or another on abortion. But, um, but the trimester framework of Roe was the, uh, was, the, was the prevailing approach. A companion case decided the same day, Doe versus Bolden, which in, Roe versus Wade was a challenge to a Texas abortion law. Doe versus Bolden was a companion case decided the same day that challenged a Georgia abortion law and gave a quite extensive reading to what counts as an exception for the health of the mother to include not just cases of extreme maternal fetal conflict where a woman's life is in danger, uh, but also uh, cases in which a woman's mental health and well-being were implicated. With the result that effectively upon the decision in Roe versus Wade, it became virtually impossible for the states to regulate abortion full stop for all nine months of pregnancy. Uh, that routinely the courts, especially in the 1970s and 80s, struck down various measures with regard to uh, uh, informed consent with regard to abortion, where abortions could be performed, uh, information and advertising with regard to abortion, uh, and so forth. And so that was the law as of 1973. And then in 1992, the court revisited Roe versus Wade in a case called Planned Parenthood, versus Casey, which actually came out of Pennsylvania because uh, it was, the law was signed by then Governor Bob Casey, who I think was from Scranton originally, right? Or this Casey's from Scranton, um, in a, uh, involving the Pennsylvania Abortion Control Act, and uh, which imposed a series of restrictions, uh, basically allows for abortion up until 24 weeks, which is the law in Pennsylvania, uh, imposed informed consent requirements, waiting periods, uh, and so forth. But at the same time, uh, there was a request from the uh, then uh, uh, George H.W. Bush administration for the court also to revisit Roe versus Wade. And what the court did in Planned Parenthood versus Casey was that a plurality of three justices, Justices Kennedy, O'Connor, and Souter, crafted an opinion that said, we're going to hold on to the core of Roe's holding, but we're going to junk the trimester framework, and we're going to put the line which Roe itself had at viability and say that viability, the states may not restrict abortion or the states basically can only uh, regulate abortion in a way that doesn't impose as they crafted it an undue burden on a woman's choice to have an abortion and that public viability, the state may regulate, but again, with an exception of uh, life or health with the quite capacious understanding of health that Still, the bill from the Doe versus uh, Bold viability, viability preserved in Planned Parenthood versus Casey. Number of cases uh, came over the transom ever since then, uh, including uh, a case uh, from the about 15 years ago, or so about a federal statute that prohibited a uh, form of uh, late late term abortion, partial birth abortion. Uh, cases involving regulations of abortion clinics in states like Texas and Louisiana. But uh, throughout there had been, as again, I don't need to tell you, a lot of opposition culturally, politically, and legally to what uh, Roe versus Wade had said. And so that leads then to this summer's watershed moment uh, in the Dobbs case, which involved a Mississippi statute that prohibits abortion uh, after 15 weeks an exception for the life of the mother or in cases of severe fetal abnormality, but otherwise imposes a ban on abortion, uh, elective abortion after uh, 15 weeks, which of course is pre-viability, which is 23, 24 weeks, somewhere around there. And so the question that was posed in Dobbs is, does this pre-viability prohibition on abortion uh, can that be 
square with the Constitution and with the precedents on abortion that have been developed by the court in Roe, Casey, and various other cases uh, that I'm happy to talk about in more detail if people want. And what the court decided, I don't need to tell you, uh, is that Roe and Casey should be reversed and that the issue of abortion should be returned to the electoral political process where it was when the court decided Roe versus Wade in 1973. And remember, as I said earlier, consideration or framework that the court says they should look to when deciding whether the Constitution protects an unenumerated right is, is the right deeply grounded and rooted in the nation's legal history and practices. That's where the opinion goes through the history of abortion regulation at common law, it talks about the founding uh, of America, sort of the time of the ratification of the 14th Amendment in 1868, and shows uh, that with historical evidence that uh, abortion was often criminalized. It was uh, sometimes at the point of quickening, as it's sometimes called, which is an old fashioned term for when a woman could feel the movement of a fetus in pregnancy, uh, but that it was never recognized as a constitutional right. And in fact, even the, from the historical evidence, states like Ohio that by the 14th Amendment in 1868, within short order, also enacted criminal prohibitions on abortion in almost every circumstance. And so the historical argument of the court, which goes on for many, many pages, is that the Roe Casey abortion right argument fails the test of a right deeply rooted in the nation's history and practices, that it's the historical record simply doesn't bear out a long recognized right to abortion uh, in uh, the English common law or in American law <clears throat> at the time of the founding or in 1868, or for that matter, as one commentator has said, it's not just that the defenders of Roe and Casey have a 1791 problem or an 1868 problem, they have a 2022 problem that there's consistently is a deep division in the country about uh, when abortion should be legal, what points in pregnancy, under what circumstances. There's tremendous geographic difference between uh, states in this question. And that the fact that the country hasn't come to a settlement on this question is all the more reason and underscores the argument that it fails the test for a 14th Amendment substantive due process right that is so strongly rooted in our nation's legal history and practice and so widely accepted by the states and citizenry that to deny, <clears throat> to, to deny that right would be a violation of the 14th Amendment. And so that was the decision that was uh, garnered the support of five justices, Justice Alito writing for himself, Justice Barrett, Justice Kavanaugh, uh, and uh, Justice uh, Thomas, and uh, Justice Gorsuch. And uh, so they said that Roe versus Wade, for all the reasons I've said, uh, fails this uh, inquiry test of what counts as a substantive due process right on the 14th Amendment, and therefore should be overturned. And not this, I think, is often, or at least sometimes in the commentary, is confusing. It's not that the Dobbs decision says that abortion is now illegal, but that rather it's left to the political process in the states, in Congress, by the people and their elected representatives to regulate as they see fit, but that the Constitution itself does not impose a one-size-fits-all answer to this uh, contested moral question. I'll just mention briefly, um, and again, some of you probably uh, uh, read this over the summers. Uh, some of you may, may have forgotten it, <laughs> that there are a couple of concurrences in the case. So sometimes if uh, justices agree with the outcome of a case, but they disagree with some of the reasoning, they'll write what we call a concurrence. So there is a concurrent, one concurrence by Justice Thomas, uh, who has been deeply skeptical his whole career of this whole exercise of substantive due process, effectively thinking that the Constitution protects enumerated rights, and maybe, and there's a complicated story about the function of privileges and immunities in the 14th Amendment section one here that we don't need to go into, effectively saying that outside of what the Constitution protects, textually provided for enumerated rights, basically judges should stay out 
and leave the political process in the states and in Congress to work its will. Uh, there was a concurrence by the Chief Justice, uh, John Roberts, who said that in his view, the 15 week pre viability ban uh, should have been upheld, but that the court should not have struck down or should not have reversed uh, its holdings in Roe and Casey about the existence of an abortion right in the 14th uh, Amendment. He, uh, his argument was that 15 weeks, uh, by which point well over 90% of abortions, we know statistically have occurred, uh, that by 15 weeks, uh, a woman has had enough time to decide whether or not to have an abortion. Uh, and that uh, because there's sufficient time by, the, by that point, uh, it doesn't impose an undue burden in the language of Casey to prohibit abortion after uh, 15 weeks, but to nonetheless hold on to the core of Roe and Casey, at least to some extent. Uh, and this gets into some, again, things we talk about at considerable length, but basically this point of uh, viability concern, uh, because Roe and Casey had affirmed and reaffirmed that viability was the key line in the point at which the state may or may not, and again, with health exceptions and so forth as a complex consideration here, but the, the state may or may not regulate abortion at viability. That was, that was the, the clear cutoff line. And at oral argument, uh, both the Solicitor General Elizabeth Preloger and Julie Rickman, the, the lawyer for the Center for Reproductive Rights were asked, is there any way uphold Mississippi law that's a pre-viability prohibition and hold on to Roe and Casey. And they said, no, there's not. You either have to overturn Roe and Casey or uh, you have to reaffirm them and strike down this uh, Mississippi ban. The Chief Justice tried to find a middle ground here and say that, well, 15 weeks is long enough. Uh, but as, uh, and here's the argument between Justice Alito's majority opinion and the Chief Justice on this, Justice Alito's view was, well, then you'd be basically rewriting Roe and Casey again. Casey already reversed a lot of Roe and rewrote John trimester framework, substance the undue burden pre-viability standard. And now we'd be rewriting it again and saying, well, 15 weeks is long enough, but of course the next case would be 12 weeks or a so-called heartbeat ban at six weeks. So the chief justice's opinion while trying to find this middle ground concerned about reversing precedent to cavalierly uh, was, as Justice Alito says, also kind of putting off to the other day the inevitable confrontation of a ban at some earlier point in pregnancy and, uh, and the Constitution. So uh, then there's a dissent, joint dissent of Justices Kagan, uh, Breyer, and Sotomayor uh, that relied in here the, the um, you kind of one of the key considerations to the, especially those of us who teach law students and lawyers think about th their main concern was this issue of precedent, this issue of, as it's called the fancy term, stare decisis, let the decision stand. The concern that Roe and Casey had been the law for 50 years, 49 uh, technically, uh, and that the court should not reverse these decisions because they had been so relied upon, they've been proven to be so durable for half a century and that the court uh, should therefore not, uh, not reverse them. They, their arguments were all precedent, precedent, precedent. There was little effort to defend Roe and Casey as an original map. Roe and Casey, even back in the 1970s, a lot of more uh, who favored abortion rights as a matter of policy and politics said, you know, rose a kind of weak foundation. Uh, this 14th Amendment substantive due process rationale in Roe was kind of weak to begin with. But the dissenters and, and even in the um, at oral argument uh, in, in the Dobbs case last year, there was a tremendous reliance on precedent as a why the abortion right should be reaffirmed. And there's in the majority in the dissent have a deep over questions like how egregious wrong were Roe and Casey to begin with? Uh, have they proven workable? What are the reliance interests of women and families uh, in, uh, in having a right to abortion uh, and so forth? So just a few, so that's the, that's the law as it is today. And as we've seen since the decision came down in June, 
it has uh, generated uh, a lot of uh, political profile uh, at the level of state politics, uh, at the level of national politics. Uh, and the question now that uh, been returned to the states, uh, that what kind of regime of abortion will parts of the country, uh, or as people on either side have argued, should we have a, na a national solution, but a national legislative solution in Congress? Uh, there's an effort on the part of uh, on the part of the Democrats to enact a law that would uh, essentially preempt all state restrictions on abortion and would allow for abortion uh, through all non nine months of pregnancy. An effort on uh, the part of Republicans, most recently this week, a bill proposed by Senator Lina that would impose a nationwide 15-week ban like the Mississippi ban that was uh, in Dallas. And so that's where uh, the state of the political question uh, is today. And so state legislative races, governor's races, federal uh, uh, races for Congress and Senate and in a couple years for the presidency uh, will, uh, will often contain uh, some issue of, uh, of, of abortion. So a few things just to say a way of kind of concluding observations um, that, uh, that I think we take from this. Uh, one is that, to turn to a point made earlier, that in 19 versus Wade was decided, it invalidated the law of every state in the union, and that there were late 70s to find a workable compromise on abortion as they did in Europe. And as scholars like Marianne Glendon showed in her book, Abortion, Divorce, and Western Law, there's a case to be made that while the United States is peculiar in many respects, more religiously conservative in some respects, that the issue of abortion has not generated anywhere near the heat in other parts of, uh, of the of West, uh, other liberal democracy as it has in the United States. And that some part of that story maybe is that the political compromises that are an inherent part of the regulation of abortion were foreclosed by Roe versus Wade. And that where in Germany, there's a ban on abortion after 12 weeks, in France, there's an abortion, a ban on abortion after 14 weeks, in Denmark, there's a ban on abortion after 12 weeks, all I should say with exceptions for uh, medical complications and so forth. But in all these countries, they came to political compromises that have not have for the most part not led to the kind of deep divisive polarization around this issue that we have had in the United States. And that one argument is that that is because Roe rather than helping to bring about a national solution hindered a solution to the question of how abortion should be regulated by foreclosing the question from the political process, leaving it in charge of the judiciary to impose a one size fits all solution on the entire country regardless of different regional variation with regard to abortion, where it polls in some states very well on the pro-life side, and in some states very well on the pro-choice side, and that the Roe-Casey framework for, foreclosed any political uh, compromise on that. It also, uh, and again, some of this is uh, disputable, but it had arguably a result on, on the court, uh, the process of nominating justices to the court, uh, became just an issue of, you know, how will they interpret this statute or what's the view of presidential power or how to understand the relationship between the federal government and the states. But it became this litmus test question of how will this justice vote on, on Roe versus Wade? Will this justice vote to reaffirm Roe versus Wade or will he or she vote to reverse Roe versus Wade? And so it uniquely, in contrast to any other issue, polarize the judicial confirmation process around this question, because rather than the people making the decision in through the states and their elected representatives, it was decided by the members of the Supreme Court. And so all the effort in this fight went not into state legislative races or gubernatorial races, it went into nominations to the Supreme Court. And that a bit was, has not been healthy for the court and has not been healthy for the confirmation process. And finally, it meant that a lot of elections turned on this issue of abortion, but not so much, not so much about you know, how abortion would be regulated, but what kinds of justices and judges uh, different kinds of politicians would be, voting for, would be voted for. 
And in that respect, uh, while pol our, our polarized, divisive political culture has many, many causes, uh, at least one arguably has been uh, the issue of Roe versus Wade, one size fits all national solution to what is in the end, a question to which the people and their representatives should be accountable. So in conclusion, I, I always tell my students, a lot of questions in constitutional law come down to the issue of who decides on a particular question. The Constitution is mostly very specific about who decides. Who decides where the army should go in battle? Well, the president's the commander in chief. Who decides about uh, uh, other, other kinds of questions with regard to say taxation and uh, issues about regulating commerce? Congress gets that power in Article One. It would be peculiar indeed, and I think the merit of the Dobbs opinion is that it recognizes that it would be highly peculiar if this most tested, deeply divided moral question of abortion and whether or not there's a right to abortion at different points in pregnancy and under different circumstances were properly left to the justices of the Supreme Court. And so, as I said, even if you favor abortion as a moral matter and as a policy matter, I think it is a salutary thing that the justices of the Supreme Court this summer decided. Okay, can you hear me now in the room? Wonderful. I hope everybody on Zoom can hear me too. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Prusak for, and the McGowan Center for inviting me uh, back to respond again. And uh, thank you, Dr. Moreland, for that uh, very informative and comprehensive talk. Um, Unlike Dr. Moreland, I'm not uh, a lawyer or a legal expert, uh, and I receive the decisions of the Supreme Court, like most of us do, as non-experts and as citizens. And so that is how I will be addressing the subject tonight, uh, from a more personal perspective, although I hope uh, not an entirely non-intellectual one. So I grew up not far from the campus of Kings in Scranton. Uh, and so I am especially sorry not to be able to be there in NEPA in person tonight. I think many of you who are in the room and maybe uh, many of you who are uh, on Zoom as well have a background that's similar to mine when it comes to thinking about issues of abortion and the law. Um, I was born into that post-Roe uh, world of uh, polarized politics that uh, Dr. Moreland was talking about. And uh, as I grew up in Catholic school and in my parish, I learned to think of Roe versus Wade mainly as something that I was supposed to be praying for an end to. As I understood it, the logic of that was simple. Abortion is immoral. Roe is the thing that allows people to do it. And so the Roe decision is obviously unjust. And in order to fix everything, we will have to overturn Roe. I developed uh, a more nuanced or maybe just a more ambivalent view of these things as I grew, but I still found it personally disorienting when the, when the Dobbs decision was released, officially overturning Casey and Roe, because for me, it didn't feel like a victory. Even after all of that in my past, I found I didn't really feel inclined to celebrate, and I didn't feel confident that with this, a better day was dawning for human dignity and for the right to life in America. So. What I want to do here is uh, unpack that a little bit. So the most striking feature of Justice Alito's opinion in Dobbs to me as I was reading it is the way that it disregards the effects that the decision will have in particular on women, but also what it will mean to return the issue to the states in a practical sense. Uh, and this was a reaction and a concern that I found I shared with the judges, uh, the the three liberal judges who wrote uh, the dissenting opinion when I read that. Uh, but th the legal term for what we're talking about, which um, we heard uh, Dr. Moreland use in his talk, as I understand it, is reliance interests. So the court has a responsibility to consider who relies on a law as it stands and how it will affect those people or that population to overturn it. Um, and there was plenty of testimony available to that end in this case, but it seems to me that the majority opinion in Dobbs brushes it aside. So where they say overruling Roe and Casey will not upend concrete reliance interests like those that develop in cases involving property and contract rights. The Dobbs opinion quotes from the Supreme Court's ruling in Casey, which apparently expressed confidence that, quote, 
reproductive planning could take virtually immediate account of any sudden restoration of state authority to ban abortions. And then the Dobbs opinion goes on to dismiss the idea that it is the court's role to adjudicate what it calls a more intangible form of reliance. In other words, the idea that, quoting Casey again, the ability of women to participate equally in the economic and social life of the nation has been facilitated by their ability to control their reproductive lives. Now, I'm not an expert, obviously, on the ruling in Casey, but the notion that any sudden restoration of state authority to ban abortion could be immediately accommodated so as to prevent women from suffering any major inconvenience is obviously wrong even setting aside the ways that abortion access allows women the ability to shape their lives, which Dobbs calls beliefs that are beyond the purview of the court, it is undeniably true that women, and I would add the men who care about them, do indeed have direct and urgent and very concrete interests in the ways that a sudden removal of abortion rights protections can affect health care. So I wrote a column for Commonweal Magazine last spring that was titled, When Abortion Isn't Abortion. And it described how an emergency situation in my own life led me to recognize how harmfully narrow our working notions are of what abortion is and who needs it. So in my case, I had a pregnancy that ended on its own early in the first trimester in what seemed to be a fairly unremarkable way. But my body failed to release the miscarriage and I ended up losing so much blood that I was going into shock. And the treatment for that is thankfully fairly straightforward. I had an emergency DNC and I was home the next day. And at this point, advocates for abortion bans would say that what I'm describing isn't really an abortion or it would be protected even in states that ban abortion. It is true that from the perspective of the Catholic Church that abortion as a category of sin is not relevant to my story. But when you write a law that says that a doctor cannot perform a DNC, for example, on a pregnant patient at all or after a certain date, unless it is necessary to save that patient's life. And when you also put criminal penalties in place for that doctor and potentially even for that patient, if they cannot prove that there truly was a life-threatening emergency, you are placing barriers to medical care that can and will result in real concrete harm. So my survival depended on the presence of a doctor who was adequately trained, available immediately and willing and able to perform the necessary operation on a stranger without consulting a team of lawyers first. No pro-life person that I have ever known and no one that I have ever prayed alongside would want a patient like me to die for lack of any of those things. But those things, that appropriate and accessible reproductive care depend, at least at present, at least in this country, on the existence of Roe or something like it to protect healthcare for women and to place it outside the reach of politics. That experience was not my first pregnancy. It wasn't even my first miscarriage. So I was brought up short realizing how little even then I really understood about the scope of women's reproductive care and all the things that can happen to a pregnant body. Since the Dobbs decision, many women have been speaking out, some with stories much more heart-wrenching than mine. And thanks to those testimonials and to journalists reporting on the impact of new abortion restrictions, I imagine that everyone listening to this event tonight has learned a lot about what pregnancy involves and how it can go wrong that you didn't know and didn't think you needed to know before. You don't even need to be pregnant to be affected. Even postmenopausal women have found themselves unable to fill prescriptions from their doctor for medications that in some states are now inaccessible because of their potential to be used in abortions or to be abortifacient. So the dissenting opinion in Dobbs, which is signed by Justices Breyer, Kagan, and Sotomayor, spells out the consequences of the Dobbs decision to prioritize the interests of the state over the interests of the person seeking abortion or reproductive care. They write, how much risk to a woman's life can the state force her to incur before the 14th Amendment's protection of life kicks in? How much illness or injury can the state require her to accept consistent with the amendment's protection of liberty and equality? The Dobbs majority holds that women can have their say on all this through the democratic process. Our decision, Alito's opinion says, allows women on both sides of the abortion issue to seek to affect the legislative process by influencing public opinion, lobbying legislators voting and running for office. Women are not without electoral or political power. 
this, it seems to me, is non-responsive to women's immediate concerns on the level of let them eat cake. A woman hemorrhaging in the ER can't solve that problem by running for office. A victim of rape who didn't even realize that she was pregnant until after her state's new abortion cutoff can't solve her problem by voting, even if she does happen to be old enough to vote. So in their dissenting opinion, the court's three liberal justices observe, all women now of childbearing age have grown up expecting that they would be able to avail themselves of Rose and Casey's protections. It's a different way of looking at what it's been like to grow up in the years since 1973. And before I had my own medical crisis, I think I would have said, well, not me, not pro-life women, because legal or not, abortion is not an option that I would avail myself of. So in my case, it took a brush with death to make me recognize that the extent to which I am a beneficiary of Roe and Casey's protections and the extent to which removing those protections places me and all women, and to an extent, I think all Americans in some danger that we didn't have to fear before. I grew up thinking that the relationship of the fundamental right to life and the law was straightforward, or at least could be straightforward. And I grew up believing that overturning Roe was a necessary first step toward some kind of saner compromise. But I no longer have that confidence and I am no longer confident that the democratic process is sufficient to protect and prioritize the rights of women in a way that is in some way consistent or workable across the entirety of the United States. Since the days when I was praying to see Roe overturned when I was a schoolgirl, I have learned that a commitment to enshrining respect for human life in American law must take into account the lives of women in every circumstance to be worthy of the name pro-life and I think of the Constitution. And so I can only regret that I don't see that kind of accounting in the court's opinion in Dobbs. Thank you.